here to talk about alignment and um, through a business that I run called Mirror Mirror. And um, what I want to do is start off with a bit of story and share a few slides just to get us into the zone. And I'll come back to discussion. Um, and, and please do chuck something in the chat. I don't actually think I can see chat while I'm sharing a screen. Um, but, but Pierre, let me know if people want to... Uh... That's my only job. Right. Good. Um, Excellent. Right. I'm going to oh, presentation up and share my screen and then talk you through where I'm coming from and what this is all about. And hopefully we'll get some good, uh, some, some good conversation going. All right. Let's hope you can see this. Mirror Mirror started in about uh, 2016. Um, and part of the story about why I um, started it is, is, well, I'm from the UK, like I said, I, was, I went to university in, um, North, in Newcastle and when I finished, I started working for small businesses um, and I worked for small businesses and teams of about 10. And when you're in a team of 10, many of you may know, it still takes a bit of an effort, but you, you, know, you can keep connected to what's happening, uh, what happened, uh, how are we reacting, uh, what are we doing next, etc. So that whole piece about keeping connected as a team, when you're in a team of 10, it's okay. Then by some kind of twist of fate, I got offered um, a job as a communications consultant in a global energy company based in The Hague. And, um, and I was thinking, you know, this is fantastic. You know, finally, I'm in with the big league and I'm going to find out what it is that this company Shell is doing to be earning so much money. How come they're so well organized? Let's go and find out. So I clicked my heels and off I went. Um, and when I got there, uh, I was a bit confused actually, because I couldn't enjoy the same level of kind of clarity and connectedness and alignment that I had in a small business because there was just so much going on. Huge in sort of complex environments. Um, I was working in the knowledge sharing team and then went on to the Open University there. And I felt a responsibility as a communicator to, to clear this up. You know, how could I possibly create clarity for other people if myself, I wasn't even clear on what was going on, right? So uh, I, I began to get quite confused about it because everybody else seemed okay. Um, everybody else is walking around briskly, looking perfectly happy. Um, you know, how can that be? So I went to a senior leader and I sort of said, you know, what is this? Um, you know, this is what I'm thinking and feeling. Um, he's a very open kind of person. And he sort of said, yeah, this is ambiguity. I said, yeah, yeah, it is ambiguity. He said, well, you know, we kind of consider it a leadership competence to be able to handle ambiguity. You know, with that, it's kind of like, oh, okay. So A, the conversation is closing down. But B, that means I'm probably not going to be a leader because I'm finding this very difficult to handle. And it didn't make sense to me because I know for a fact from my experience in even if it was only 10 years, but 10 years of working in small businesses, that ambiguity affects decisions and actions every single day, large and small, and it annoys people and it costs loads of money. So what's going on? And um, I spent another couple of years there. Then I went freelance, carried on working there. I worked for another organization. I realized it wasn't Shell and it wasn't me. It's any large organization that is just complicated because they're full of what are now called the fog. The fog is just the natural thing that occurs when lots of people get together in a very unusual scenario um, called an organization uh, where they have their assumptions and their biases and their misunderstandings and behavioral influences. I mean, you can call it diversity, um, but it's completely inevitable. But it does define a problem that people weren't looking out for because they just, it seemed like it was all kind of, you know, that's just part of working in a large organization, get used to it. Um, but actually, it defines an issue that I think we're probably all very familiar with, and that's that effective collaboration isn't just about putting the right people together with the right knowledge in a room and expecting them to get on with it. They actually face a challenge of in integrating their different perspectives and collaborating to be effective. And again, you know, people are like, well, we've got way bigger priorities to deal with than this. And, you know, if you're just a communicator, just get on with sharing the message, you know, as if this isn't a problem. Whilst at the same time saying, you know, I wish we could increase EBITDA rates by, by a quarter percent. That's our, that's our global challenge as an organization, a quarter percent increase in profits. And I'm thinking, well, surely if we get on top of this fundamental thing called alignment, you can achieve more than that. So it didn't make sense to me that it wasn't being addressed. And I did a bit of research and I look in, looked into it. And I promise you that the slide I'm going to put up next is the most wordy slide you will see in this presentation. But it's worth 
it's worth it because this just sums it all up. Misalignment, I'm going to just take you through it briefly. Misalignment, it's problems caused include confusion, wasted time, money and opportunity, diminished productivity, demotivation, conflict, power struggles, project failures. And I like this the best because it's really indicative. Time and energy of people spent doubting, conspiring, guessing or gossiping when that same energy could be deployed in moving the organization forward. And that's exactly what everybody in business, in especially leaders, when they're trying to get the strategy implemented, they're trying to get things delivered, they're trying to move it forward. And this is the kind of mud or the fog that holds everybody back. So you can look at it through these this lens. And of course, an example, I actually had this in a subsequent um, telecoms company I was working with uh, in 2010, 2011, we're going digital. Well, it took literally a couple of years before the organization could get a handle on, like all the way through the organization. What does that mean? So that's a kind of a message clarity issue, if nothing else. But then you can take it at a more, at a, at a sort of like managerial level with this kind of alignment gap. You know, somebody might be thinking, we need to improve quality. Why isn't it a higher priority? And if they're not able to express that, they'll carry on making micro decisions and taking actions that um, play to that bias around quality, whether that bias is valid or not. But if they don't, they won't get to find out why somebody, something else could be a high priority and other people won't get a chance to find out why this person has a bias and it could be perfectly valid. Of course. Okay. So the situation I say I see it as now, and I, I know a lot of you are familiar with a lot of these concepts. It's just I'm putting it together in this line of logic for you, so that you can see the alignment lens fully. Is that you know more complexity and change means more sensor to to align of things. And if you look at even right now, and I'll come on to remote teams, um, but the the more that we're going through at the moment, the more there is to the more scope there is for misalignment. Okay. Um, traditional employee communications, which I've started to develop a real allergy to these days um, from my experience um, in this area, um, they don't align people, but they, they do try to create some broader context and they create an identity in an organization through the brand, but they don't align people. And I think they're kidding themselves if they do, because channel um, communications, I think, is in many cases, disengaging people. I did go to a Play 14 conference um, in Amsterdam last year where I was actually booed when I admitted that I had a background in corporate communications, which I'd never had before. Um, but anyway, um, comms isn't doing it. And technology, you know, Yammer, SharePoint, whatever else you want to talk about, um, that I think is helping people connect. I think it's helping people share information. I don't think it's helping people align. I had this slide before all of this kind of coronavirus stuff came up, which is about the future of work, you know, dispersed teams, diverse teams, short term staff, freelance staff, automation, the demand for better, faster, cheaper products and the need for accelerated learning. But we're here. We're there already. I mean, a lot of people, as you know, are just um, really flummoxed with all of these changes going on today. Um, but I, so this is already here. Uh, we're looking square at it. Um, a bit more of the research behind where the mirror mirror alignment sort of philosophy is coming from is that um, I want to go right back to 1972 when um, social constructionism as a, as, a, as a theory, if you like, um, came out of Berger and Luckman's work. And they are talking about how meaning is constructed between people through language to create a shared reality. So people make sense of their environment. That's, this is where the fog is coming from, really. People make sense of their environment by, by checking it off against the people around them. And that's really why we kind of get factions and different groups and even different religions possibly in the world because people construct their reality socially. And then another piece of research that's critical here is that Teams are more effective when they're aligned. This is Van den Bosch, based in the Netherlands, through learning behaviors. So we've heard about psychological safety. There's the other three are task cohesion, which is about commitment, group potency, which is about how confident people are, and interdependence, how much they can rely on each other. But without these behaviors, people can't become aligned because they can't trust each other and rely on and um, be confident in the social, re the social um, reality that is being shared, if you see what I mean. 
So it makes sense, you know, if you have psychological safety and you trust your colleagues and they share their perspectives with you, you're much more likely then to adopt those mental models for you as your own and to build a shared reality with them. If you don't trust them, you'll probably reject what's being said. Okay, so that's fairly logical. And then the next slide I've got on this, just two slides on the basic research here. Um, fascinating stuff coming out of neuroscience, particularly around the fact that our brains are prediction mach machines. Again, you're probably familiar with this stuff, but I just wanted to create a sort of zone that we're in around alignment here. So uncertainty makes people uncomfortable, as we can see today, um, and people need to make sense of things before they take action. And so if things don't make sense for people, in order for them to be able to actually move forward, they have to make up an explanation and a story as a basis. And that this links to the next piece, which is that 80% apparently of conflicts occur at work because of stories that they make up about what's happening because they don't have the truth or the answers that they need. And then they use those as, a, as the basis of actions when they're not true. So, you know, we come back to this fog. It makes everybody look like headless chickens running around, if you like, um, a bit. Um, but this is just the way we are naturally. So, um, Alignment is both about behaviours then, if I just recap, and it's about the way, it's about cognition, it's about the way that people um, perceive the world, perception is reality, it's about the way that people socialise, so it's not just about the old-fashioned notion of alignment being that if your personal goals stack up to the goals of your team and the goals of the organisation, then everybody's aligned, which is one area and an important part of it, but it's about the vertical um, sorry, the horizontal alignment between people. So let's, let's have that meaning. Alignment is both to the strategy and between people. Um, and the other thing, misconception, is that alignment doesn't mean that everybody thinks the same thing. Alignment is about compatibility between views because you do want to be able to leverage diversity and you want to be able to leverage different kinds of views when you, when you put together um, a team and expect them to make progress. Um, uh, so this is about the way that you can um, harness that um, without having everybody um, get into groupthink or anything. So I um, want to introduce you to this tool then. You know, what we do is we identify and measure alignment gaps between people and between people and the strategy. And um, we support leaders and teams in addressing those gaps. Our business model isn't that we do that per se. We have a tool but we train up people so that they can do that with their clients. Um, and the main purpose of alignment is about getting people engaged, um, getting people aligned, helping people to become more empowered and more agile, all towards more effectiveness. Okay, so very quickly how that works then, we have a couple of different products, they both work along the same lines. I'll take you through the right-hand side, the quick scan. Um, it's a 20-minute e-survey person which asks people how they perceive both the behaviors and their whole um, context at work. We then compare the results between people in a team where they share a context because they have shared goals so that you can see the alignment gaps. This is put into a report and it's literally then talked to directly. I think I've probably been in the Netherlands too long because I love this direct approach to things. It's about, all right, well, if you think this, or we're not pointing at people specifically, by the way, it's all anonymous. It's more about what's between people. But if there's a certain load of people that think this, and another half of the team that thinks this, and it's different, how can we find a way forward? It's not about, ah, well, if they think differently, then, you know, they must be, you know, challenging the relationship there, and it must be different. No, let's just put it on the table. So it's a kind of safe way of turning, turning differences that are difficult into... Um, data, if you like. So the full picture is the same, only it goes into much more depth, double the number of questions. We also do that, um, have an interview per person as well, because we do go into much more depth about the context, what factors, for example, are affecting the team. I'll give you an example of those questions. So there's three layers to it here on the left-hand side, we've got about, we ask how people understand things, how people see the behaviors between team members and how they see this organizational supporting the, the organization supporting their effectiveness. So on the shared understanding, a question would be what's happening within your organization that is affecting your team? How do you perceive your environment? 
If you've got lots of different answers like this, there's a conversation worth having. It could be there are lots of different factors and everybody perceives those factors. That's fine. That's compatible. But it's the conflicts that we want to get rid of. We, want, we don't want to see um, people saying different things. On the behavior side, let's take the psychological safety um, category. It's safe to raise difficult issues and questions in my team. People can rate that. We've got all sorts of different indices for different categories. And then you can see the shaded area is um, the, the high and low scores provided so that you can see where the average fits. As it happens here on this chart, the highest scores were all about 75% and the lowest were all at the bottom. But in terms of freedom to raise issues and questions, that team scores 28%. Now, I'd say in any team, that would need addressing. Um, but it's not so much the scores, it's what's the context of the team in terms of what scores do they need to improve for their objectives. Okay, so um, there's, a, there's a whole piece here on how to facilitate this uh, with teams um, that, that we train on. Um, but it's, it just puts it out there. Um, and then on the organization support, even though this is less within the sphere of influence of the team, it's good for them to know how they feel about stuff because half of this is giving people the opportunity to be heard and accept things that they may not have decided themselves or may not, may not have thought of themselves. So organizational factors, um, things like recognition, reward, um, competencies, tools and resources, um, rate, for example, we have the tools and resources that we need um, and you can exactly see there whether they think they've got that. So it's great feedback for the organization as well. Now I'm just, I'm skipping through here because I want to get to the interactive bit, but this is, this is the stuff that, you know, you need to know. So we show this at the team view as the team view and they can, um, we track the progress of this, um, how people felt before the workshop, after the workshop, and then three to six months later. So you can see progress. Um, and we think it's, it's really about the agile minds. It's introducing teams outside of the IT function into what agility is about because they need to take responsibility for their views and they need to collaborate with other people to move forward. So it's really about the mindset thing rather than anything kind of heavy going. Um, and this can all be delivered virtually, of course, because you have the opportunity to present the report to people and you can move into discussion groups and breakout groups to, to, to discuss different parts of the data. And um, what it's probably not good for on a remote level is having people get into the in-depth conversations, but at least you can have those identified and table those to occur later. So uh, there's only three reasons why we think this works so well, and it's because it, it's all people oriented, of course. When people become aware of mental models that could serve them better, they move across to them and they can move across to them super quick. It doesn't take long. It doesn't cost much. And they don't really know it's happening, actually. But once they see something in a different light and it makes more sense, then they'll probably adopt them. When people do that with other people in their group, they build more empathy and understanding. So inclusivity becomes a lot more relevant. And then when people share knowledge and thinking in an open, respectful environment, um, they get to a more actionable shared current reality. So the outcome of this workshop, of a mirror mirror workshop, is to have them understand what they want to change specifically and how they're going to do that to become better aligned. And some of that occurs in the workshop and some of it is next steps in an action plan. Um, so what difference does it make right now to teams? Like I said, engagement, openness, inclusivity, better shared understanding, more awareness of team behaviors, more ownership, and more clarity on what needs to change and how. So I've got a couple of case studies. I've got more stuff on things like um, how this differs from other things, how it would compare against an employee survey that we can get into depending on the questions. And I've got a couple of case studies to talk to. But I thought maybe is now a good time just to stop for a second and stop sharing my screen uh, and just see, see what you guys think of it uh, or what your reactions are. Volker. Well, it was a lot of stuff and uh, interesting was uh, why is that uh, possible? So uh, can we move again to, to this slide with these uh, three key findings? So if, if the people are aware that uh, something could work differently, they're able to, to change their behavior. Okay. What, what were the others? 
which slide did you want to me to go to? The, the last one was these three columns. This one. Mm -hmm. So when people learn about it. Yeah, normally in change management, you, you have uh, then the point that um, there, there's no need to change. Yeah. So that's um, sometimes one, one obstacle to get the people over this um, because a lot of them are thinking of, well, I, I can do that as before. Yeah? So that's, um, for example, one point uh, what is uh, coming out of my mind. Right. And I think it's, it's, I guess this is putting a focus on change that they can influence because it's in their control to change the scores and the way that the data looks. And it's putting the emphasis on, well, how do they think they ought to do it? I mean, a lot of this is not is not about consulting. It's about total facilitation, whereby we wouldn't want to go in and say, well, we think you should change, you know, graphs A, B and C. We think that, that you're responsible for what you want to change and that you need to talk about that now. So it's just really providing that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So, so um, if I can build on uh, Volker's uh, question, um, wouldn't you still be interested in a bit like uh, cause and effect? Um, going back to this, uh, you know, is there even a pain point? A, um, a, a you know, that would uh, create a readiness or uh, an awareness for a need to change, right? So, if you have in your survey certain results coming out. Mm. Um, what would be typically the impact, right? How would people know that this matters to them? And it's not just some abstract number. So to answer your question to start with, here, here is where you might want to use, where it might be valuable just as a, from a situational point of view. Um, so with onboarding, people sometimes can take like four months just to get in tune with who's who and what, what are people thinking and what's going on. And I think this can accelerate the onboarding process really quickly. Um, so that new leaders can sort of set direction quite quickly because they will already understand how people, what people think of the current situation. I'll, I can share a sample report a bit with you so that you can see what I mean, actually. If I change to this view, are you able to see this new report now? Or is it the same yellow screen? The same yellow screen. Still the uh, yellow screen, yeah. Yeah, okay. I'll come back to that in a minute then. Um, in terms of engagement, I think people... If people see that they don't have um, a common sense of direction, it is, it, they can feel quite undermined by that. And so being able to show that data in order that they can then have a conversation that leads to a better sense of direction is more engaging. If teams are in trouble and they, they, they feel frustrated, um, virtual teams or remote teams feel disconnected and teams in change can feel anxious or um, underprepared for the future and this can increase that sense of clarity and preparedness so I think you would use this situation this in certain times and when people see their own data it's kind of a total magnifying glass glass as opposed to the employee survey, which is just much more generic and not that useful. So I just want to go into a, um, a sample report just to give you an indication of how, how it might look. Uh, you don't really need to see all the numbers and everything. Um, I'm just going to quick scroll uh, past the immediate blurb. So, for example, um, we'll start with what did they score themselves on as the highest behaviours? And what are the lowest behaviors that came out? And in this team, this team here, imagine that they do have innovation as part of their remit. If they are not feeling safe to take calculated risks, they're not sharing knowledge, and they don't have the freedom to raise issues and questions, they themselves in that team would be feeling quite uncomfortable just looking at this data, I think. So we don't want them to feel uncomfortable per se, but we do want to bring forth a view that, isn't previously visible because they don't often get the time, time or the uh, opportunity to evaluate this so accurately um, to be able to identify, well, what is happening here and give them a chance to discuss what's going on. So in terms of the pain point, we're not telling them going in and telling them what their pain points are per se, but I think they would be able to relate to the data in a way that brought that out. So something else that we do is we ask, um, some key kind of ratings on opinions around clarity, preparedness, pride, positivity, and alignment to the vision. 
And here, if the number here is 15%, we don't just only want to focus on the negative stuff, of course, but if they are, say there's seven people in the team, one person has said 50%, but mostly everybody has said something down in the 20% area, that's an incredibly low score. What can they do about that? I mean, how would they have carried on without, without addressing this? This is the kind of speed reflection that is missing, I think, in a lot of teams. Then we ask the bold question, what needs to be better established for this team to be more effective? And they can choose more than one option. They're basically all saying, we don't know what we're aiming for, we don't feel very prepared, and we don't have the, the, the ability to, to bring our whole selves to work to, to, to do our jobs here. Now, that's a kind of overview page. I'm going to go through this really quickly, because, and you can contact me offline or whatever, or even take one of our trainings, which are free. Um, but here we have the main context page. And I'm just going to zoom out a little bit because you don't really need to see the detail. But we ask them, what's the vision of your company? What's the purpose of your team? What's your team goal for the next 12 months? And what are you most concerned about? So this is all about them for their data. So I would be very surprised if there's any team not interested in this. And if they're not interested, they all need to be shot or fired. Um, I'm joking. But um, I think here you are able to see, are, these, are the results here compatible? And there's one, there's one chart here that we use quite a lot in our training that has people say, you know, what's your team goal? Um, to lead the group strategy, to develop take technical capability. They're all saying totally different things. And, and you can talk, a, a team can talk at cross purposes a lot without really realizing this because they're saying the same words. Yeah, capability. Yeah, you know, we're developing, you know, strategic uh, capability. We're doing this and that. And, and it's quite easy for people to miss the fact that they're actually not really seeing eye to eye. Um, the next page is all about impact factors, what's impacting their team. So that was the question on what's happening in your team. Sorry, what's happening in the industry that is impacting your team? And they can say how they feel about that. We ask that at the organization level uh, and at the team level again. It's the same format. But here they get to see how, why does somebody else think somebody else, it's something else is more important and feel it's a challenge when I think it's an opportunity? Well, let's talk about that. And what should we do next? Well, you know, you decide that they're the team members. And then finally, we get to these behavior charts, which I think are the most powerful because they're so specific. Literally numbers on each category, psychological safety, um, task cohesion. So that's, have you got clarity? Are you committed to, to achieving your goals? Are you good at making decisions and taking actions on commitments? So it really gets into a high level, level of granularity around what is this team doing that is making them effective, like taking actions on commitments here? And what are they doing that is um, preventing them from being effective? That's right within their control. Um, so in terms of problems, well, that's... I know it sounds odd here, but that's for them to perceive because as a facilitator, you would give them this data and you would say, well, how does this relate to your work? Where, where is the problem? If you had to choose five things to improve, what would they be? Does anybody have any comments on this? I have a question on one topic. It's um, on top uh, there. It says um, about, uh, yes, share knowledge proactively. Do you have information or knowledge about data drilled down why they don't share proactively their knowledge? No, because that because, yeah. that should be in the discussion. That that's that you have to have a workshop on this data to move the, the numbers because just putting it out there, this is just a snapshot of how they perceive their environment. But that's that's a conversation opener. What, you know, what, why do they say that? What, what could be better? Yeah, because at, at every company I've uh, joined was um, the subject is um, digital transformation. The question is popping up, who has the right knowledge to be uh, the right one in the team of digital transformation? So this is one point, and the people asking why I should share my knowledge. <laughs> what is my value? So if I share my knowledge, will I be 
part of the team in six months or not anymore. Right. So, so it's really important to understand why people don't want to share their knowledge proactively because it's part or one answer is they have anxious about their jobs. Yeah, and I think if here is an opportunity then for the line manager or the facilitator, because this report would always be discussed with the line manager in advance of the workshop, partly to get the handle on what is the objective of the workshop exactly, but partly also to be able to brief the line manager to come to be able to handle stuff that's that's coming up and, and support them or coach them in that. And if that's what some of the responses are anticipated to be, or if that's what comes up in the workshop, which is I can understand totally true. The line manager could draw attention to some of these other effectiveness behaviors that are being valued in the team or the organization that would, that would provide an alternative value add um, model, if you like, for somebody to follow. So let's go back to some of these behaviors. Let's look at task cohesion, um, commitment, committed to achieving, being good at making sessions, taking actions on commitments, all of these behaviors are endorsed, if you like, for being, well, it's partly coming out of the social sciences as to why they're there, but it's partly showing people and giving people a compass as to, well, what behaviors are valued because you want the scores to be as high as possible that is going to move them away from hoarding knowledge as a behavior and towards sharing knowledge because that's what's valued and that's what's appreciated. And it's, so this is actually an educational program in team effectiveness then at the same time. I'm not saying everybody will come out of that, but at least you're having that first conversation and you're raising awareness of that so that people who think that hoarding knowledge is essential to keep them in the organization can, can have a, something else to hold on to that gives them an alternative. So one point, um, my experience is about, uh, of course, as a one I have another experience as a woman. So one point, the line manager has his own goals, not the same as the team members. Yeah. That's one point. Um, the second point is um, it's really hard and uh, challenging that the team members collect knowledge. It's not done by one week in, in one uh, training for three days. Yeah. The whole of their life, more than 20 years, for example, people who are uh, on road as a uh, developer or requirements engineering. And uh, going to ask the line manager, my point of view is the wrong way because the line manager has every time his own goal. When you say own goal, do you mean private agenda? Yeah. More on, the, more on personal level. Yeah, on a personal level. So if the it's not the line manager commissioning this activity, but it's say, I don't know, a sponsor, just by commissioning this activity, they will be they will need to be endorsing what it's trying to achieve. And if the line manager is not on board with this, but their sponsor is, that's an alignment gap. <laughs> but if the if the sponsor is not on board with this, and the line manager isn't, they're not going to do this. So this is for customers who are ready to look at behaviors and um, cognition that leads to team effectiveness. And I think that the, the, the environment that you're discussing is, it, is extremely challenging and extremely dated from a, a maturity perspective. Uh, I mean, you know, maybe I could have put that in nicer terms, but I mean, that's Hoarding information is um, not very high up the level of maturity to be doing then an activity like this. So maybe it wouldn't be applicable to them. But this, uh, coming back to the previous discussion, I think this is where maybe, you know, uh, a little bit more, how should I say, um, easier approach to really understand and appreciate uh, uh, your approach here is to show these cause and effects. So if you have these certain, call it dysfunctions, right, or observations that you have, these are typical behaviors or typical outcomes or actually, you know, uh, dysfunctional results we have observed in other places, right? Then people have maybe an easier way to tie that back, why this very discussion matters. Yeah. Let me just, I've, somebody, I don't know if, if anybody's heard of clean language, but it's a, it's a whole, yes, I have. yeah, a whole movement around, asking questions that involve minimum of bias. 
And somebody asked the question, what kind of alignment gaps? This one, this is a slide that's really rich in information and it's, there's only one slide so it's, and it's quite, um, quite full on. So I'm just gonna stop my share and I just can't seem to share my entire screen for some reason. So here's, here's what kind of alignment gaps, which takes a look at and involves, if, you, if you've heard of Lencioni as well and his five dysfunctions of team. So it shows you where they as well. And if I just take you through this slide, maybe this answers some of your questions here because we've got four gaps. One is a structural gap. Processes, policies, tools, reporting lines, something else. We don't really deal with that. That's not the people side of it so much. The other one is information gaps. And these are the easiest to deal with because they're about misinformation, missing information or unclear information. And you can either just recognize that it's a gap or you can plug the gap by getting the right information or just find out when you can get the right information. Either way, you're closer to being aligned. This is the, the really the big one that we're looking at. It's perspective gaps. It's about all of those things in the fog, the personalities, different beliefs and values, um, mindsets, inclusivity, conflicting objectives. I'll come on to that in a minute. And then there's purposeful alignment gaps. And I think that's what we were just discussing a bit. This is what we call the dark side of misalignment because it's about selfish motives, frankly, and that the world is full of people with this. I mean, this is what makes a lot of people's jobs a complete misery. When people's conflicting life priorities, situations, cultures, or motives engender mistrust, fear-based behaviors, fear of being seen as negligent or incompetent or being excluded or being, or being in conflict, disinformation, hidden information, all of this stuff, it's huge. Now, we're not going to get that coming out in our report because nobody's going to say it and, and fess up to it. Um, but here's how we look at it. All of these four gaps have these impacts in common. This is the pain point that people don't like. And when it gets so bad, it starts in, impacting performance. This is when something like this is useful. More specific impacts um, of information are, are for, let's take it from the top, structural gaps are this to and from transactions, attempting to unravel what's not working. So this is, this is just a pain. The information gaps, you get loads of ambiguity, as I was saying at the beginning, you get guesswork, you get speculation, um, it's annoying. The more specific impacts of conflicting perspective gaps are these silo mentalities where people start to form into groups or they club together in group think, et cetera, or people get in a bind, you know, I can't do this because, because, because of that, you know, everyone's stuck in a corner. And then the Lencioni piece really comes in down on these, these, the dark side where people are avoiding accountability, they've got a lack of commitment, attention, no attention to results, what people do and say is different, et cetera, et cetera. And the only way to resolve these, what's got in common with this, is when people are aware of the gap and they accept that the gap is there and they are willing to close them. Once you've got that, you can move into other, the deeper things like, provision of the right information and a good narrative, effective conversation skills with openness, respect and inclusivity. People can make bridges between different perspectives or they can accept decisions that weren't their own once they've been heard and in the right conversation with this openness, respect and inclusivity. So really you're talking about people accepting things that they didn't like uh, because they've been heard and they can hear others and empathize with them. People coming to a new conclusion, which is about saying, well, you've got this perspective, you've got this perspective, and actually, if we did a bit of both, we'd get a better result. That's the ideal world. Uh, or in new information, but when we can't get this deeper level, this dark side of, of, of misalignment, what you can do, though, is bring people closer into a feeling of safety that it's okay. They don't have to mistrust. They don't have to fear X, Y, and Z because they're being welcomed um, and leadership clarity on the behaviors that are expected. So Jan, when this comes to your point, if people are hoarding information because they're scared of losing their jobs, the best thing that can happen is that that can be on the table and that a leader can say, um, you know, what we expect to see is this, this, and this, and it's okay to do this because this is the reward. And just to state that, because then they are, they are, much more likely to, to move up into being in a, in a more um, trusting place in order to, to align. 
and also if there's consequences of anti-team behaviours. And I would say that hoarding information is very anti-team. But I hope this gives, does this give you a bit more on the consequences? Sometimes um, that is uh, my experience. Sometimes it's a ping pong game between sponsor on top level mm -hmm. and the line manager uh, who is responsible for um, creating and, and maintaining and growing up teams. So the top management says, oh, you have my um, commitment yeah. to the team. And then the team is alone with the line manager. <laughs> and that is uh, a, a critical gap. So um, the top management, it's not involved in more detailed task and development f uh, from line to the team. The team has only a word, it says commitment from top. And then the line manager uh, is doing his own commitments, not the ones from top management or from the sponsor. And I suppose... You know, and the team, sorry, um, just one, and the team members are not trusting anymore the commitments. And right. instead of proactively doing and sharing, they are jumping back and waiting and doing not the right things. Well, you know, there's a couple of things here. One is that when we talk about team, you can also have this at a higher level, at a team at a higher level, or a leadership team, an executive team, if they're willing to do it. In the environment that you're looking at, they probably wouldn't be willing. Um, but this mirror mirror is a way of identifying alignment gaps in these areas, information gaps and perspective gaps, and measuring them so the teams that want to take action can get into the right space to have that reflection time. It's, it's, the workshops are less than a day. Uh, it's not going to, to solve every problem, but it is a start when you're looking at teams who are willing. So if you can find somebody in an organization who's willing to do this because they can see the way that it's heading, that's a start. But I think there are certain situations where mirror mirror is not applicable, and one of those would be where there's too much dark side of misalignment going on, too much corruption, if you like, or there's not willingness. Sometimes it's both. There's right. too many gaps between the levels from the team to the program, to the line, to the top management. Of course, from top management, there is a commitment. Yeah. And until reaching the teams, there's no value anymore for the team members so much losing values from it's top awful. to down. It's just terrible, yeah. isn't it? Too much. So after 25 years and uh, after joining as a consultant into more than 25 companies in the change management is every time the same, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> Team members um, um, don't have the courage anymore to to go proactively into the into, into their knowledge sharing into their jobs because um, they know they are too much um, losing value between the levels. Um, for those of you who are able to put on your um, camera, please do because I want to get a show of hands. Actually, I want to just sort of see how many people are in similar organizations who who's in a similar organization where there's there's uh, if i can describe it for you jan yeah so that's three four uh five maybe um hey, come on scott <laughs> what i've so been you, there i have been there yes so you're in organizations where so so pierre how would you summarize what Jan's just said, the situation, the, com the company is, mm, what's that then? They are... The uh, <laughs> so let, let's say it's one, one of the points you mentioned is about uh, we are not sharing the same goals. So when you have these multiple layers of management, means they have different agendas that the main agendas. So I, I'm, I have my biases with my methodology. I want to, to be as neutral as possible. 
But uh, this concept is quite old and I always liked it. I was introduced in, I was a lean, a lean coach a long years ago. And we used to call it this Hoshin Canary. Is when Toyota started to build globally the, the, the uh, manufacture their factories, they started to be aligned first. It took, it took a year to get the alignment. Then they created the A3 models. So maybe if you know where you have all the business cases, just an A3 uh, template because it was the largest size that you could put in the Telefax at that moment in time. And they started to think about the alignment. And then when you have the, the top alignment, then they have to make what we call a catch ball. They have to send the alignment paper to their subsidiaries until they're going to the shop floor. And, and then it has to come up like a catch ball. You're throwing the ball, you catch it. Yeah. And then once it's going on a, on a bottom and going back on the top, the whole uh, um, uh, strategy has to be aligned. It was how you manage uh, in lean manufacturing, in big plants in globally. What happened is in, in mostly in software uh, world or something is it's built for compliance. It's not built for uh, competition or effectiveness. It's to be compliant. It means you have multiple layers of people, possibly not competent, but very good manager. It means nothing changed. Pierre, if I may jump in, I've uh, witnessed a very, very similar situation just in the company I'm, I'm still with. Uh, and uh, it goes even beyond just the company and the management layers. It actually includes the key customers. When they have the expectation, back to your compliance point, right? We manage a major new innovation as a compliant matter, as if you know this was in a convergent market where it's all about predictability. And we can put all the details down three years ahead, and then it's just execution. Meanwhile, they're totally overlooking that there's really new ground, right, that the innovation has to bring and, and real significant technological um, challenges that have to be overcome that just don't fit itself into a convergent space. It's much more an emergent space. And so that's why I keep asking back um, uh, also earlier, uh, Lindsay, in this, you know, when we show people the why, what's behind, what's the effect of a certain dysfunction, then maybe we have a chance to even have an open discussion with the various layers and levels involved, right? Unless we really show, unless we make people feel what the difference is, I don't think we'll move much. I, I personally think maybe uh, one solution could be to have hybrid teams where you have people from all the hierarchies which discuss on the problems and try to find solutions to that. Maybe in some way that could help. We try to engage from the lower level to the, let us say, manager or two levels up. Maybe this can yeah. be a solution. In general, I found cross-functional teams, and this one would be a cross-function even in terms of levels, right? Uh, typically, get to conclusions or to reasonable uh, results much faster. Maybe if I can uh, add just one more thing. Uh, on my experience, this has a lot, a lot to do with the structure of the company uh, and maybe of size of the company also because it comes in line and kind of uh, in Germany usually. <laughs> so if you have like this big company uh, uh, which uh, has other, I don't know, 2,000, 3,000 people working and you're trying to build this agile organization which is like uh, onto the market it's not so easy to get this uh, points uh, the, the, the touch points with the structure of the organization of this new virtual organization which has a good or good uh, actually it has a commitment from the top management and you you're also right I don't know who said this but you have like maybe two or three levels of management between this top management, which has the alignment, and the teams which are working on, on which are actually doing the work. And this, uh, and this uh, commitment, it's just got lost on the way down. It's just like, uh, it's really amazing. It's like, whoo, and it's uh, away in the, in the air somewhere. <laughs> um, uh, and the teams don't really trust it. They don't have the trust. Uh, and uh, this is where it all goes wrong. 
So you, if you, if you try to get the alignment, uh, you have to get the trust first. This is this is uh, which uh, this is my experience. And the bigger organization, the older the organization, the better structured this organization, like terrorism, <laughs> like uh, the the more difficult it is to get this uh, change or this uh, this mind mind change in in the organization. Yes, yeah, sometimes my experience. <laughs> sometimes is your your commitment is in the cloud. You cannot find it. You're right. It's somewhere in, uh, on SharePoint. <laughs> <laughs> we 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 said like, and then in this, uh, we we had like this uh, newsletter on Christmas. We said we are committed to this organization. <laughs> You're no. at one point is about um, the history and the structure of the company. The second point that is important: what kind of customers do you have? So, if you have um, customers, uh, they are not sensible which kind of product or only ask um, for platform for buying. So, team and team behavior is not so important. But if you have uh, customers and really close touch points, working um, with the team members and the teams together, then uh, it's more important that the teams and team members feel comfortable and the line manager and the top management is, has not only a commitment, they are involved in the whole life cycle and closed time boxes and um, coming together in small uh, faces again and again and again not at the beginning at, at the end only so what we um, I don't want to put this a uh, mirror mirror one day intervention forward as a total solution to everything so is we we Switzerland open conversations in a in a, by doing this you can open the conversation in a very informed way that cannot be disputed I mean if this is what a team member have said about themselves you're able to put that forward. And also, if you do it at the team level and do it across multiple teams, we can aggregate the results, take that to the next level, and then they can see what's really going on. It's just extremely powerful feedback. So I promised that I would show you a little bit about, and I see something about what there's, you know, there are a lot of questions in our regular employee survey like this. I just want to go to the, um, the one slide. Um, that looks at well what's the difference between this and um an employee survey and i'm just going to take it piece by piece because they're there's they look like small points but they're all really important because if you take a discovery based approach and what that means is you're asking open questions to people who can write their own free form text you're not closing them in with questions that put put their responses in the boxes that you want to see that's one thing if employees are working with the data that they've provided in their own unique teams, it's so, it, you cannot get anything more relevant. It's about their team and they provided it. Um, it's part qualitative, so that brings in a previous point. It reflects the unique context of the team because um, it, is, it is playing, it's about their objectives. And then also, I don't think you see many inclusive employee surveys that really come back in a, in, a, in a way that promotes effective collaboration and appreciation for diversity. So this whole inclusivity is a much bigger word. Now I've, now I've unpacked it more, I see that it's, it's got so much more in it. So it is about that respect. It is about that openness. You can't be inclusive if you're not open to others. And you can't be inclusive if you're not respectful or if you're not actively inter interacting. So by taking data to people and having them go through a conversation on it, that's about their team, that's another thing. Um, this out action outcomes focused piece is that the entire point of the workshop is to get people to, to, to um, clarify what questions do they still have, what actions do they think needs, need to be taken to be more effective. And if they hadn't taken those actions or raised those questions, they wouldn't be as, as prepared to succeed against their shared goals and then you you measure the results of the workshop 
So here, with an employee survey, you'd put all the same questions out. Um, fair enough, there could be different team questions, but they all come back. Often they don't get debated, and then you know you don't know what the results are. Um, so in a sense, it's it's fast, and it delivers. The process is designed to deliver change. Now, if that's just opened the door in your for your team, Jan, where they have, or teams that you're dealing with, where they are, they are confronted with their own data as a start point, and it opens some conversations, and that's all of the progress that they are prepared or take, able to make at that time. It's still change. So it, it's all about we wouldn't go on into an organization and start to tell them what they wanted to do or what they should be doing differently and how they ought to align and they ought to get the managers in and know they ought to get the stakeholders in and well let them decide at the team level they should come up with points around stakeholders and around bringing people in to become more effective and it's just an excuse for an opportunity to do that you know on one hand it can deliver huge results if we come here when people become aware of mental models that serve them better what i mean by that is tiny incremental changes it, they can be huge big kind of penny droppers where people are like oh i didn't realize that that's what we were supposed to be doing which is massive but at the same time it could just be like oh i see why that person doesn't doesn't attend these meetings and i see how i could maybe ask them to do that instead a different way alignment can be super small things and it can be super huge things um but i think it's got to take place first at the team level because at the team level they share the context but then you can aggregate so you can either start at the top of an organization and come down and, and align people down the way and again it's not just about strategy and it's not just about goals or you can align people at the bottom of an organization and use that as feedback to drive change going up the way as long as the communication keeps coming back down so that they know what's changing um, but this is basically just a structured approach to a much more robust way of interviewing people and comparing perceptions than you might normally do if you were going to go into a team and just interview everybody in an informal way. It gives you a, 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 a sort of research-based structure on which to go into a team to evidence the kind of work that you think is needed. Now I give you some other information how I see in the Agile world your tool because I like it. This is why I invited you because I think this is a tool we, we needed. For me, everything is alignment. So I'm an Agile coach. So I'm doing, so all the meetings we have are just alignment meetings, in fact. So if you know a little bit about Scrum and something like this, so we do daily meetings. So when you do it very badly, you just, it's a status meeting, which is awful like hell. You don't see the system, the team as a system. But if you think, hey, that's just an alignment meeting and bring a pot of coffee and drink it. And, and then it makes things completely differently. And it's changing the behavior. Then you can see maybe shy people starting talking, feeling more comfortable. You see, you're, uh, you're allowed to be a good person, a bad person, passionate about Agile or whatever, you want to have the full change on one shot. And that's a problem, the bad answer, sorry, can't. That's a cultural shift, which is quite huge. It's in the Agile worlds, we call it transparency. Transparency is just making uh, factual the reality of the situation, uh, is noticing how good or bad you are. And based on that, you're taking uh, action that is not implicit, it becomes explicit. And when you know as a coach how to translate these words. Pierre, let me, let me maybe add. Uh, I think this needs this uh, kind of a base environment. Uh, I think Lindsay called it uh, uh, psychological safety. I know we have the title emotional safety. Uh, which is more or less a kind of a base trust you're allowed to, to uh, give your opinion, you're allowed to uh, uh, share your approach, and, and it's not kind of home against you again. And so I think this is the, the kind of culture that you need as a starting point. I, I, I heard your point then, psychological safety is the basis of all of this, right? Yeah, exactly. And and, me, okay, so let me... Let me yeah kill out the video. Okay, should we, I hope it's better now in terms of audio. Yes, it is. Is it? 
Okay, so I think first you need to generate this uh, emotional safety that people really dare, that people are really allowed uh, to share that uh, kind of statements. Uh, I think this is the basis for the alignment. No, no matter whether you call it psychological or emotional safety, they, they must feel kind of safe in that exchange and that sharing. And it has to do with, let's say, interaction, collaboration with culture, uh, how you really work together. Yeah, I completely agree. And some of our other um, facilitators basically talk about um, setting up the psychological safety environment as an essential prerequisite for the workshop, because how are you going to align people if there's not even psychological safety in the room? I think that's the point you're making, isn't it? Um, yeah. I will ask Scott, and from the USA, US perspective, how does it work? Um, uh, Pierre, uh, in the US, from, from what point of view? So the question we are addressing here, this kind of alignment, psychological safety, I know there is a cultural switch in some some case I'm, I'm everything i'm hearing is the same it's the same dynamic in the u.s same dynamic and i i I'm, i was gonna i was curious lindsay from the standpoint of alignment actually I, I i share a funny funny story uh i i joined an organization multinational ironically european based but in the u.s Corporate headquarters has 1,400 people supporting 50,000 people in various department stores across the U.S., Australia, what have you. New in my role, and I'm asking, okay, wh wh where's an org chart? How do I know who to, to reach out to? And company policy is there are no org charts. So as a new employee, I have no way of knowing who I work with or who I collaborate with, who I align with, because from an HR point of view, it is a dangerous thing to have an org chart because headhunters could get a hold of it. This is the story that was created about this. Headhunters could get a hold of it and then use that to identify people to steal away from the company, notwithstanding the fact that people need to understand how to work together. Ability to align is, is such a critical function. I was curious, Lindsay, in, you, you addressed the fact that the tool provides a way of giving people an opportunity to have conversations to open up the dialogue around trust, awareness of what's going on. Um, and, you know, that's, it's, you know, it's, it's surfacing the micro narratives that people are feeling in their, in, you know, in their hearts and minds and kind of putting it out there from a, you know, that transparency that allows people then to start resonating with this and, and, and making it aware. Have you, have you found in your case studies that this works this kind of conversation works better at the team level working up or from the, from the executive level working down? Well, um, in a sense, you're, you're always starting from the top because the person who's making the decision as to whether or not to do this is more senior probably than, than the line manager of the team at the bottom. Um, but it's got, got advantages both ways. Um, you know, the organizations who, who, who need the clarity there's no sense in doing it with one team because they may get clarity at that moment in that workshop on a number of things. You're never going to completely clear the fog. But um, well, a month later, something changes. Things change. Lots of impacts happen. It's a complex environment. Alignment, misalignment creeps up again. And if you've got one team in a, that is aligned in an organization that is misaligned, it's, it's, you're missing a trick, really. So I'd say it doesn't matter which way you go as long as it's a bit more than one team in a if it's a, a complex environment um, but you're absolutely right it's about it's about surfacing stuff that people are maybe not even aware of um, themselves consciously until they get an opportunity to discuss it with others and and talk about right what what and it's very tangible it's not some people often perceive this as the woolly stuff you know oh we don't want to sit around aligning and talking about emotions you know well you're not talking about emotions it's about talking about business what is happening that could be more effective? It's about delivery and implementation, really. And part of implementation and delivery is about the way that people behave and the way that people perceive things. Simple as that. So it's, it's still a difficult message to get across to some people, right? Can I, can I, can I uh, just add or ask one thing? For sure. me, um, alignment is something that's, that has to come from, I wouldn't say from the top or from the management, but from the leadership. It's something that a leader has to 
it's it's a, it's a responsibility that a leader has in any kind of organization to get this alignment uh, um, through the teams. Uh, so there's some there has to be somebody or a team of people or I don't know a constellation <laughs> uh, which give the framework for for the rest of the company to work for the teams to work with. Uh, so for me, alignment is something that is actually a kind of a top-down um, um, initiated process and it has to be accepted on every level which you, which is going through or well, in, a, in any in any organization form if you have like the circle organizations or kind of organizations so they have to accept it but there has to be somebody who gives this alignment is it is it like this in your experience or do you say it can be different well because we got to reframe it a bit mm -hmm. Because if you're asking people in a team, let's just say they are mid management or operational level team. Mm -hmm. They're an operational level team and they're saying what they think the organization vision is and what they think their objectives are. Now, the crucial meeting with the team leader about that data before it reaches the workshop is, is that the objective that the team leader understands from his superiors or her superiors? In which case, you're bringing clarity and, and strategic alignment into that workshop because you're able to say, well, here's the information that you should have that we clearly don't have. So that's one thing. But uh, when we're reframing it, we're saying that alignment is strategic clarity as well as um, alignment between people. And the between people part has got, has, is, is all, of, of course, it's influenced by the culture of the organization, by the um, examples that are set by people above, et cetera. But the, the horizontal alignment of how do people interact in order to work compatibly together towards their shared goals can be taken at a team level alone to be worthwhile. You've moved because somebody's joined or, or lost or something. But anyway, I was looking at... Oh, there you are. Um, so so the, the top-down clarity can, is literally a few messages. Strategic clarity for, in, as relevant to a team is a few messages. What is the vision of the organization? What are they trying to achieve? And what's that got to do with this team? The reason why most communications are much more complicated than that is because they're trying to address everybody all at once. So, but, but you do need buy-in from, from the organization to have mm -hmm. this going on. So you have like this kind of um, methodologies which, uh, um, which support this, like, I don't know, OKRs. You hear a lot about OKRs <laughs> or kind, kind of other methods how how you keep this alignment updated <laughs> well this is where i see that what, what mirror mirror does is really help the facilitator shine because whatever your lens is on the world you can bring that with you and you can continue on the next steps that are identified in whatever thing where you th feel is needed i mean if you think that an okr is needed a month or a week down the line after this you know go for it this, this mirror mirror tool that we bring is intended for people to use with their clients in whatever way and shape and form they think it needs to be used according to the objectives of that team. Mm -hmm. So um, there's a whole load of other tools out there or processes that you're familiar with that you might want to bring in. It could be about mm -hmm. some people use Myers-Briggs, some people hate Myers-Briggs um and wants to get everyone into a daily huddle that's a free-for-all and that's down to your skill as a facilitator yeah i, I like these sentences from from Pata, um because it's it's pointing a bit out um you have alignment that's coming from the top uh, so much and uh, actually with an HR project at least in my experience we are talking not so much about alignment yeah, of course it's needed, yes, but um, somehow the wording is, is not used, yeah. But what we are talking in, in extra uh, projects and, and uh, transformation projects, what is the company's vision, yeah, and and how to, to come to that, what, what are the strategic uh, issues, the, the pain points, and um, how to overcome them. And then more modern uh, method is then the OKRs, yeah? And um, might, might be there's here some irritation about the wording, yeah? 
and I think uh, alignment is needed. Yeah, but um, my my HR projects we are we are using that wording not so much. Yeah, uh, and part of the difficulty with um, really reaching out is that it's like I said, people think about alignment purely in strategic terms from a structural point of view. They don't think about the alignment between people. They don't think about it as something that is actually a communication process towards effectiveness. I agree, the way that people even see alignment isn't, isn't helping, but I think more and more people are talking about the need for better alignment. So it's, it's becoming more relevant. But it's the old fashioned view is, you know, alignment is when people's goals match up and then we're done. And that's just completely insufficient when it comes to actually getting into people's heads about how they collaborate to be effective. And at the end of the day, it comes down to do strategy execution. This is a strategy execution um, tool because, and it's a diagnostic. So it comes before anything else. If you did eight teams in a function and then you aggregated the results and then you saw that there was really no strategic clarity, then you would maybe want to do another exercise about strategic clarity. But this is the sort of start point on where is, where are the, What's the culture of the organization as insofar as it's disposed to alignment in terms of how everyone behaves and how, how is everybody perceiving everything? So it'd be ideal actually for an online uh, workshop or an online conference where people, you could do these surveys in advance and have all of the different teams surveyed and then you could bring the results to the conference and have people discuss that in groups about you know, where are we and what needs alignment? Yeah, absolutely. That's a very good point. And even if you relate it to the actual uh, condition of work, because most of us, are, we are working from home now and are working on a program, so we have a lot of people. So you have to be aligned. And if you're not keen to work alone in your uh, home office, you, you're, you're feeling stressed because you need to understand what's happening. And if I'm not in all the meetings, Maybe something weird is happening, right? And then you have also emerging bad behavior. So you have the guys who are not keen to work on it. They over authoritarian. They say, oh, I'm the boss, now do this. So, but in fact, we have to align. And, and to reduce the stress, we have to align. Like birds, the flocking behavior. It's all about alignment. It works better when you unmute. Um, yeah, I'm working or I'm uh, consulting uh, rather uh, on IT management and large IT organizations. Uh, we also have teams of teams. So I was wondering um, how mature these teams have to be. Uh, in agile environments, you often put teams together and they need to be mobilized so they are very immature as a team. Um, but you also have in larger organizations, hundreds of people, you have many teams, so you have to scale this approach. How does that work then? Yeah, so um, when, I, when I talk about maturity, I think if a team is willing to discuss and learn about alignment, then they are, in, they are eligible because that's, that's all it takes to get past the first piece. Of course, when you get, I did a team in uh, London before the shutdown happened um, a couple of weeks ago, and their scores were incredibly high. It was a, just a single team organization, so of course they've got a head start anyway. Um, but even if their scores are high, there's another story behind that. And they discovered in the workshop, for example, that because they know each other so well, that's actually a, a, a barrier to being open because they, they want to protect, the, um, protect the relationships. They don't want to confront each other. So maturity always goes on and on, and I think willingness is the start point. In terms of scaling, um, the quick scan product that we talked about can be turned around in, I mean, depending on how quickly it takes the team to answer questions, and we normally recommend that they're given less than a week to do that, otherwise they'd move, lose momentum. Um, we can uh, turn around a report ready for a team in two days, for example, and the workshop is half a day. If you wanted to run uh, multiple teams, um, and you were going across, I don't know how many teams, dozens, let's say, you would presumably hook up with some of your colleagues, some of your associates, or try and do it very quickly because you don't want teams to be aligned over a long period of time. 
because you're you're losing the boat then alignment has to happen quite quickly right now i understand klaus point is so scaling is usually a term we use it says how do you do it when it's large so even you can align 10,000 people it's not an issue at all because one human being has not 10,000 people in front of him the maximum we know is between 150, 150 and 200 guys we have so is you always have and maybe then is how are you structured so usually you you should one team sh is sharing the same goal so maybe if you have a program management level or maybe very portfolio management the goals of a portfolio management is not the same like in operations it's not the same goal as in support so it's not the same team but maybe so you will have the team support this team the team portfolio management and sometimes you make a high level alignment once a month so everybody can share her, uh, their ideas but this is not a real alignment this is more information but maybe you can adjust a small piece of alignment into it but that's really great so basically class you'd get hold of pierre okay and yes thanks i, I see that point pierre very well taken thank you but yeah. but i also think that's a really good idea you could just run a simple survey of seven questions or so to everybody find out which teams are the most misaligned and then only run this with the most misaligned ones and do a high level exercise on the top of the other ones like you were saying pierre but if we come back to the original one of the initial points about uh, pain if you have a, a leader who is desperate to get their strategy implemented and wants to do everything they can to make sure that everyone's on the same page and that there really is no waste of time because they're in such a rush this would this is an accelerated way to do that so that would be the point to go in and say okay well here's something if that makes sense Jan is, Jan is challenging us how do you define team how do you define oh well our teams that we define for our purposes are between five and twenty people because any more than twenty people um, is too difficult for people to keep hold of in their heads around collaborating on a person-to-person -person basis but they also share a goal that's the two criteria from our perspective they have a shared goal and it's less than 20 people so my point of view a team is not only five people in one group or in one room it's it's really higher maturity they uh, they're self-organized they trust to each other they are um, working close to and enhancing their work. They have their own retrospectives, etc., etc. Not only five people in one group. This is really important to understand what is a team. Fine, but there's been so much talk about the importance of teams because, frankly, one team working in one part of the organization can legitimately be completely relevant to another team in another part of the organization other than they're under the same brand it is all about team for, for me just just by vision of an alignment it's like the sun burning down and then you have like the sun uh, i don't know how you call this in english but the sun trails and if you follow one of the trails you're aligned because you all go up to the same the same um source kind of and this is for me kind of alignment of course you can go uh, maybe a little bit uh, to the left and a little bit to the right but if you still go up to the same source or you want to to get like you said the same vision you <laughs> you're aligned for me this is by for this is the reason why it's not for me the the, the question about scaling is for me not a question because uh, it doesn't depend on how many teams you have if you still have the same goal doesn't mean how many uh, like this uh, uh, like the strains you have from from the sun <laughs> doesn't matter mm -hmm. you know, hundreds or ten or maybe one you're still working for the same thing or you are just like trying you're, you're being uh, feed it from the same source <laughs> Well, is this, is this quite strange or do you understand? <laughs> I, would, I would just challenge that a little bit mm -hmm. because I agree with the yes. sun thing. <laughs> kind of, yes. <laughs> but I would say that the image on the right-hand side is more relevant because people get, yeah. their, get their inputs and their understanding and their leverage from each other. Um, yes. In which case, it's 
this and that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you, it's not that you, you still have the same source. That's what yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, but this, the strategic guidance, absolutely mm -hmm. strategic guidance. Um, but they, because I mean, particularly agile teams, they will, this bubble would be smaller and they would all be determining for themselves what they are. What? <laughs> what? You need a training. <laughs> Tell me more. I'll give you an example. So we are experimenting with my, my program, something completely weird because I, I love doing the weird things, is uh, you can't be uh, um, on multiple teams at all. So I have seven teams that are completely distributed now. And the thing is, because it's an SAP project, which is a weird thing, is super complicated, it's going everywhere and everywhere. Everyone has a word to be, you're just working with experts, so you can't have experts in the team. They're not team players. They are rock stars, right? So the trick is how I can get rock stars to be team players. And the thing is, we, we create something, I create, oh, say, oh, we have to deliver this in six months. It's not a transformation. You have, you're, you're not selling agile. You, you have to be agile. So the trick here, we create waves. It means a wave is a one month. So we decide, we decide collectively. So meaning with customer, business, management, everyone, uh, in one day workshop, we define, okay, this is what we plan to do this month. And because everyone is there, we get aligned. Then we, everybody understands where we're going and for what reason we're doing this. Then we ask, ask at the end, who want to play where, means, the teams are just have an existence of one month because maybe the next month we will address altogether a different target and maybe you need to align in different in a different teams because I discover things that you always have. So actually multitasking, we, we like to avoid. Yeah? According to Kanban methodology, we, we don't like it. Yeah? Well, no, I have a question here, sorry. But it's not just a question, it's like a... Uh, a word I heard it before, it's about gamification. So if we can apply gamification in a workplace, like to be focused, in a, you know, to make the team focus on a specific task, so he will be rewarded wherever the reward is. I think it will be more better if we apply the gamification in a workplace and the team became motivated about achieving something. In, uh, in, a, in a matter of time, if we applied Agile, it seems like one month, if we planned for one month, something like that. <laughs> what do you think? So you use this gamification, we are doing things to reduce the joke. The risk is when you do just to win the part, to win the game. That's a quite risky thing. I used to work a lot with uh, Arabic countries. I was a lot in Saudi Arabia, so I... <laughs> um, um, Gamification. I don't know if you if you use this for a uh, knowledge transfer. That's I think uh, a very a very nice uh, way to um, to transfer knowledge uh, and to to get this transfer from from like the theory into the action. This is a good thing for like games no? or a kind of uh, kind of trying to put this. Uh, the serious inputs into a kind of a uh, game environment <laughs> um, it's bubbling up my head <laughs> I, have one, I know one one game which is helpful for alignment mm -hmm. uh, fearless journey do you know that maze maze, maze? no no maze. Fearless, fearless journey fearless journey ah, okay. so it's it's a game to yes. you're going for the point A to the point B all together as a team and you need to to, to play and as a team member yes. to, to, to get together, to find out a tactic to solve an issue. But you're also allowed to write your own hints on your cards. Okay. So when you do the change here, you say we want, to get, we want to play on a position A, we want to go on a position B, and you have one of the detractors playing with it, you will start writing down everything, all the hints you want to push in your feet during the change part. So it's, <laughs> and because you played it, you, you start uh, moving around uh, the, 
uh, going to what what is feasible at the first glance. I'm not sure it was, if it was the question. I just heard gamification. I think I just shut down and <laughs> just avoid the games. But uh, to uh, to get in touch with with uh, with the structures of certain methodologies, I think games are the best thing. Like. Uh, Serious plays, you know, you hear a lot about it. legal serious plays or other possibilities. It's a, it's a good uh, way to um, build up the barriers and to try something new in the teams, maybe for alignment for other topics as well. Um, what Does it answer your question? I'm not sure. <laughs> okay. So you have to attend one of the play 14s we are planning. I'm not sure if I can make Stuttgart. I've got something against the Play 14s ever since they said that communications people were not welcome. Uh, we don't like you. <laughs> why, why would you? But I'm not in communication anymore. I'm in alignment. But now you can see you know the boss. Absolutely. And you get the benediction of the boss. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just looking at these kids coming through on... Um... <laughs> uh, that's sweet. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Zlata, I didn't sell my daughter since two weeks. I'm so sorry. <laughs> that's, that's okay. It's bedtime. We have to go. <laughs> no, we, we are. Bedtime, I guess <laughs> all of us. Yeah, we have home office. So. <laughs> uh, I had a call of my, of my youngest daughter. I need to check with her. Yeah. <laughs> some really okay. great videos going around these days of everybody's nightmares working at home with their kids. <laughs> <laughs>